I am excited to bring the Word of God to you today. I am excited that um, the topic today, we're going to talk about devotion and what that means and, and what we can do as we go through the, the book of Revelation, how we can apply that to our lives. Um, I'm so excited that the Lord woke me up at 3.16 this morning. <laughs> and for a lot of reasons, it's a story I don't want to get into, but it, it, immediately I thought of uh, previous weeks as we go through Revelation, um, Pastor Nate's allusion to the, the curtain and the veil being torn, and that was just placed in my heart this morning. And, and so I want to remind you today, if you hear nothing else I say, that veil has been torn. You have direct access to the living God through the blood of Jesus Christ, and that's good news. And that's good news. Amen. So as I was thinking through that this morning, and I, I really I just felt like I should say those words, and, and then I just was reminded of my favorite character in the Bible, apart from Jesus, of course, but my favorite uh, is Joshua. Not just because his name is Joshua, but the dude led the nation of Israel into the promised land. You know, he, he defeated giant clans in that same land. Like the, the man was a warrior, but he also, this is what I love about him. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 11, it says, even when, when Moses would leave the tent of meeting, Joshua, the son of Nun, he would stay he, would say he wanted to be in the Lord's presence. He knew the benefits of the Lord's presence. So that man that later would lead the nation of Israel into the promised land, that, that man who would later lead them in battle, you know, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. You know, he, That's the guy, but it didn't start with military training. No, it started with being in the tent in the presence of the Almighty God. And that's why I love the story of Joshua. And, and that it hits home, close home, to what we're talking about today. Uh, the, the, the title of today's message is Love Like Jesus. Love Like Jesus. And we're opening up a new uh, section. Uh, if you've been following along in the padca- podcast, 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 if you've been following along in the podcast, you know that in chapter one, we actually get, which is very rare for a, bio, for a book in the Bible, we get the, the structure of the letter itself. We get the structure of Revelation. And so what we're stepping into now is the second formula. There's three, three parts to it. That what he, John had seen, what, he has seen, what is now, and what will be, right? So here, as we dive into the seven churches, we're, we're diving into what's still applicable to today, right? I believe in chapter 4 on is future events. I believe very near future events. And that's why I believe that this message today is so important. I believe that God is calling men and women to be devoted to him. For a time such as this, we need devotion. We don't need more doctrine. We don't need more, more programs. We need devotion to the living God. Yep. Yep. And so as we dive in today, a little bit of teaching here, just understand that there are seven churches. And those, those churches, each one, each letter to the churches, it has a structure. There's seven components to it. Some, some are missing components. Some have components switched around in different places. Pay attention to those things. Those are important, especially if it's strange. One of my favorite teachers, he says, if it's strange, if it's weird, it's important. And so as we go through, there's there's seven structures to to the letters. First of all, there's the name of the church. And we're going to talk about the name, specifically how it's important today. But there's the name of the church. The title for Jesus, found in chapter 1. He pulls different titles for himself, found in chapter 1. Third thing is, is the commendation, or and then uh, number four, the concern. Five is the exhortation, six, the promise, and seven, that closing phrase, he who has an ear, let him hear. Now, I say all that just to, to point out, as we go through this book, I encourage you, it, if you're a writer, if you're one who has to write things out, list those seven churches, list where these things are, these seven component, components, and, and figure out what's the differences, and what does that tell me according to these churches? Um, additionally, there's four applications to these letters. There was, and this is exciting, there was an, a historical church named Ephesus. There was a historical church named Sardis, Laodicea. All the churches, they were actual places, okay? And we know by archaeological evidence that these churches had the same problems that John is listing here. He didn't just make it up. Go figure, right? The Bible's telling the truth. Who would have thought that? Um, Second thing is that this, it tells us to, the letters to the churches. So it's telling us, not only is this church specifically, we're talking about Ephesus today, but all the churches were meant to read it. Because what I believe that God is doing, has done here is he's allowed us to see what potential problems a church body might have, right? 
And in these seven churches, we can learn, and we can learn what to avoid, what traps the enemy set up, what, what traps we set up for ourselves. Let's be honest. We can blame everything on Satan, but sometimes I'm my own worst enemy. You know what I'm saying? Some of that spiritual warfare, it starts with the flesh, right? And so we have, <laughs> we have, so we have other churches, and then we have all of us individually. We, we can't say, well, yeah, the church is all messed up, and then not even be looking at ourselves, right? We need to first in, do, a, do an introspection. We need to inspect ourselves and make sure that we're not lining up to these wrong things or we are lining up to the things that are commended, okay? And then finally, there's, a, um, there's an idea that this is a, a picture of church history in, uh, in throughout all the seven churches. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. But the important thing is, is today we're talking about Ephesus. And let me tell you about Ephesus. We have a picture of Ephesus, and we'd like to put it on the board. There's, there's a computer-generated app through all the uh, finds that they've had. This is what they picture it would have looked like. But you see, it's a busy city. And actually, the, the word Ephesus means the beloved. Um, it, it means it was the darling city to the, to the uh, empire of Rome. And it had lots of trade going through the region. It was the trade ports that really was, made it stand out. By the way, those trade ports are no longer... Uh, Ephesus is now, what was now Ephesus, or what was Ephesus, is now like seven kilometers away from the, uh, to the, to the beach. So they were, there's not even a port there anymore like there was. But point being is, is that there were lots of trade going through the region, meaning with trade comes lots of trade unions. With the trade unions back in these days, they all had their, their god, their, their, their deity that they worshipped and they were loyal to. And so there were temples throughout the whole city of Ephesus. In fact, it had over 20 temples devoted to different gods. And this was a very important city, not only for the Romans, but it was an important city. Paul placed a lot of emphasis on the city of Ephesus. Say that two times fast. Emphasis on Ephesus. He lived there for three years in his second journey. And, and so this, this city that was, and I forgot to mention that the temples weren't just temples. They, they, they would have temple prostitution was quite often the practice. And so this is a city rampant with sexual immorality, rampant with de demonic worship. But the point to all this is that God, Jesus, can take a culture rampant in sexual immorality and demon worship and transform a people. They're into saints of the true living God, worshipers of the true living God. Said another way, the gospel supernaturally transforms our lives and by the power of the Holy Spirit, regardless of our background, regardless of what we came out of, we can be an example of true worshipers to the living God, regardless of our past. Amen. We can love like Jesus. And that's the title of today's message, Love Like Jesus. Love Like Jesus. And what I'm, what I'm really doing here is we're going to contrast doctrine versus devotion. All right? The, the, I'll give you the, the Cliff's Notes. The, the Church of Ephesus was really good on doctrine. We'll talk about that in a minute. But what they, what they were being warned of is, hey, don't lose that devotion. You have lost that true devotion that you used to have at the beginning. And so what I'd like to do right now is I'd like to uh, first pray, and then we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 7 through chapter 2, and then we're just going to break it down. I've got a few points. Uh, we're going to break it down. I believe God's really going to speak to me. I had some good feedback from last service. God was really speaking to people. Uh, speak through me and speak to you. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now that God has been preaching to me all week long as I've been studying this. But will you bow your heads and bow your hearts in prayer with me? Father God, we thank you for your word. We submit ourselves to your word, Lord. Without any reservation, we submit ourselves to you, King Jesus. We ask that today would be a day that those that are lost, those that are, that are, are far from you in devotion, would be drawn back to you, Lord. I ask that this would be an encouraging message to your body, to your people to my brothers and sisters here, that they would return to you in devotion. Lord, there's lots of us doing lots of things, but we never want to get so busy with doing your work that we don't have time for you. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word that convicts us. Let us all become to a place where we submit ourselves to your word. We come in humility knowing that we don't have it all figured out. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's open up our Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. And if you don't have your Bible with you, uh, of course, there's a YouVersion Bible app where the, where the uh, notes are on there, but it'll also be on the board. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And we all know, because we've been studying Revelation, we know already that's uh, an allusion back to chapter one. And who is that? That's Jesus. That's right. That's right. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, 
but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Here's the bad news. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this I have, yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So here we have the church of Ephesus. Three things I want to uh, encourage you with, three points, if you will, that will be encouraging you to love like Jesus, that will encourage you that you can love like Jesus, that you should love like Jesus. And the first one is, Jesus is present in his church. Jesus is, Jesus is present in his church. Look what it says. It says, the angel of the church of Ephesus. The, the meaning, again, is, is this, this darling city. This, this, the, the, Ephesus literally means the desired one. And I believe that the, the, that's important for us because as you look at the different names of the different churches, they have meanings, every single one of them, and they all allude to what the problem is in that church, which is really cool. This is why I love Revelation because everything's kind of, kind of codish. It's kind of got a code, but the code is right there in the text. If you just look for it, you got to dig a little bit. Pull out your shovels, pull out your pickaxe, dig for that gold that's in there. So the problem with the church of Ephesus, I'm giving you the, the point, three points from now, is, is that they, they were lacking in their devotion, right? And so here we have the church, the devoted one, the, the devoted city, lacking in that, the meaning of Ephesus. And that's true, that same, that same principle is true throughout all seven churches. The name itself is, is so important, it speaks to that purpose of that letter. This is the purpose. Hey, this is, this is what we're trying to hammer home. This is your exhortation, if you will. But look at it. How, how cool is this? There were seven cities in, in what we now know as Turkey, right? There were other major cities. There was Rome, there was Jerusalem, there was Antioch. None of those churches are listed here, but these seven were chosen. And not only that, because of archaeological find, we know they were real and they had these problems. Think about God's providence and all that. It's almost as if he will allow bad things into our lives, knowing that we will depend on him, we'll get through it, we'll be better at the end for it, but somebody else in the body will be comforted by it. Somebody else will benefit from my 10 years of alcoholism. Somebody else will benefit from that anger problem I used to struggle with, right? So somebody else will, you, you fill in the blank. Whatever that thing is that you're going through right now, as Jesus walks you through that, you now can help others going through a similar situation. Think about God's providence. Seven real cities that had these real problems that are very pertinent to our lives today. I'd like to point out also that Ephesus is the first. It's the first of the seven churches listed. I believe that what the Holy Spirit is telling us is that this is the thing we need to start with. If you don't have this right, you can't get anything right. Your devotion to Jesus, your devotion to King Jesus should be first, should be of first importance. I'm thinking of Colossians where it says he is the preeminent one, right? The firstborn, right? That's what all that means. It means that Jesus is the first one. We just firstborn, the, the, the most preeminent one. But we have to make him that way in our lives. All right? Let's, let's continue on. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the lampstands. Now, here's, here's my favorite part, because I get, to, I get to share with you one of my favorite Greek words, and I don't have the prop that a dear friend of mine gave me. Um, I actually have a pair of potatoes on a string that fits perfectly around my neck, and maybe one day I'll wear it up here, but that's, that's because the, the Greek word for to walk, to walk around, is peripateo. It sounds like peripateos. So now you'll never forget that Greek word, ever, I promise. But it, it doesn't mean just to walk around. It also means to make the most use of one's time. Think about that. As the disciples were walking with Jesus, they were parapetoing with him. They didn't have a pair of potatoes around their neck. They were walking with him. They were walking with Jesus, making the... What? That's, there's no better use of your time than walking with Jesus. Would you agree? And so, but here, here's a little different. This is not the disciples walking around. Who is this walking around? It's Jesus. 
Jesus is peripateoing in his church. Jesus is present in his church. And that should be encouraging you because Jesus is right here, right now. He wants to talk to you. He wants to instruct you. Holy Spirit wants to convict you of the sin that you have in your life still. All for the reason of walking closer and deeper devotion to him. That's the purpose. Jesus is active in his church, actively walking. Additionally, he sees our motivation for the activities that we do. More about that in verse 3. But this is Jesus speaking to his desire to walk and to be amongst his people. He desires you. If you haven't heard that in your life, let me tell you, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, the Son of God, desires you. He desires me too, but he desires you. This, is, this has always been this way. Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 23. Let me show you. Because a lot of times we get, I think there's a common misconception at least, that there's an Old Testament God and then there's a New Testament God. Well, I'm here to tell you, Yahweh, God has never changed. Jesus is God and he's never changed. He's always been kind and loving and steadfast. His faithfulness endures forever. That's our God that we serve. He's always been that way. But in Deuteronomy Chapter 23, verse 14. I love hearing the pages turn. <laughs> because the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp. You see that? Because the Lord, of God, Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you up, to deliver you and give, you, give up your enemies before you. Therefore, your camp must be holy so that he may not see anything indecent among you and turn away from you. Now, there's a lot to that passage. We can have a whole sermon just over that one verse right there. But the point I'm making is, is that God hasn't changed. He's always desired to be amongst his people. It, and even in Genesis, we know that, that Adam walked in the garden the cool of the day with the Lord. Physically, figure that one out. That's another Bible study for another day. That when they, they heard Jesus coming, they heard God coming. I believe it was the pre-incarnate Jesus, by the way. But God has always desired to be with his creation he desires your devotion. Let's continue on. Verse 2. It says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. Those are good things, right? And how you cannot bear with those who are evil. Now, I just want to point out right here, I know your works. When, this is where we, we kind of have a, a handicap as being Westerners. The, the, the original audience would have, would have read those first few words, at least in the, in the Greek, and they would have said, oh, wow. He's quoting directly from Isaiah. This is a direct quote from Isaiah. My mind is thinking about what Isaiah was talking about in Isaiah verse, uh, chapter 66. Because in Isaiah 66, verse 18, and by the way, Isaiah is, this is free chicken. Isaiah is uh, divided up into 66 chapters, and they're about equal with Old Testament and New Testament, right? Like, so there's 66 books in the Bible, 66 chapters in Isaiah. Just something silly I like to point out. All right, um... Those of you who know me, it's just what I do. Uh, verse 18, it says, For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all the nations and tongues, and they shall see, shall come and see, shall see my glory. This is talking about the end times. This is talking about the time that's going to be really good for us. Really good for us. We get to see Jesus, and we get to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. That's really good news for us, but there's a lot of people that that's not going to be good news for. A time of judgment. And that should, that should prick our hearts. There are people out there that are still denying God, that are still lost in their sin, that are still lost in the lives of this world, and the enemy's just getting better and better at spinning them, right? Yeah. And so here we, here we are. Isaiah's talking about, this is, this is John now, reusing those words so that the reader would get that. What, why is John doing that to us? Why does John want to remind us of, other than this is the book of Revelation, it's about the end times, he wants to remind us of the urgency to get it right. The urgency that we must live devoted lives to King Jesus and an understanding of the consequences if we get it wrong. We will answer for our, our actions, our deeds, or our lack thereof. I will stand before Jesus one day and he will, we will have a talk. And I hope it's a good talk. I hope it's a talk of, Josh, well done, good and faithful servant. And I hope, he, I hope he says the same for each one of us in here because we dove into our word, because we were devoted to Jesus, we were devoted to the Lord. So I believe that that's why John includes that, pat, that phrase in there. But if you're here today and, and you, your devotion is lacking, 
You don't have to continue that. If what I'm saying here is like, and you're already like, yep, Josh, you got me. Well, tell me, tell me the, the end. How do, I, how do I get back? How do I get back to the devotion? Let me just tell you, it's, it's real easy. You don't have to continue in that. And we're going to get to that. There's some application that we can pull from this passage to return to a place of devotion or to go there. If you didn't know, if you've given your life to the Lord recently, if you're a new convert, let me just tell you, Jesus requires complete devotion. And there's nothing more beneficial than that devotion to the Lord. Joshua knew it, and we should know it. All right. Let's continue on. It says, But have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. Now, I wanted to include, I wanted to say something about this here. Um, this last part of verse, or verse 2 is because they were doing exactly what they were instructed. Did you know, I told you that in the beginning that Paul had spent three years, or maybe I didn't, he spent three years in Ephesus. He, he, did, he, he visited the, uh, the elders of the church of Ephesus two times. They were tight. They, were, they loved each other. In fact, in Acts 20, verse 28 through 30, there, there's a scene, we get a scene there of, of the elders actually crying and begging Paul to stay because he was going to Jerusalem and they knew, they knew prophetically that Paul would die. Yeah. He would be arrested and die. And so, in Acts 28, uh, chapter 20, we're actually, he, Paul gives them an exhortation. He says, beware. As soon as I leave, there will be wolves coming into the church. Basically, he, Paul, what Paul was saying was like, the doctrine is going to get questioned. You guys have got to be firm on this. You're the buttress of the truth. Okay? And so they were holding fast to that, that command that Paul had given them. There were no Judaizers in the church. Jesus was the God-man to them. That's the, the, the biggest attack on the church. It's not going to attack the church itself. It's going to attack the deity of Christ. The fact that Jesus is man, fully man, and fully God. It had to be that way. And as you read the Bible, you see that. And that's the attack that, that they, they experienced at the church of Ephesus. Paul, this is, this is the reason why we must get doctrine right. Paul wrote often about doctrine. 1 Timothy 1, verses 3 through 11. 1 Timothy, 1, or 1 Timothy 6, verses 2 through 7. Verses 20 through 21 in the same chapter. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Paul wrote a lot about doctrine. In fact, the book of Ephesus, you know, we, Ephesians, have you put two and two together? That's, that's the book to the same church that we're talking about here. Um, that book can, can like neatly be divided into doctrine and then love or devotion. Really, it's, 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 and it's really neat to see that. Uh, and I, I was asking myself, I was like, is that backwards? But no, it can't be because the Holy Spirit did it. So, but the point is, is that Paul wrote a lot about doctrine. It's very important. It's very important. Otherwise, we have cheap grace. You know, we have this thing, well, you just, you just be you, boo. You, know, you do your thing. <laughs> but remember that passage I read in Deuteronomy 23. Make sure there's nothing that's going to offend God in our camp. Can you say that about your house? Can you say that about your personal life? Can we say that about here at Awaken Church? We need to make sure. This is, this is the word of encouragement. This is the importance of it. I love you. We need to make sure our lives don't have anything in them that would offend God. Doctrine is important. But the motivation is what John is speaking to here. Where is that motivation? And with the next verse, we get our second point that reminds us that we are meant to love like Jesus. Jesus is sees our motives. So, so Jesus is present in the church, but not only that, he sees our motives. Our true motivation often is disguised even from ourselves. Let's be honest. You lie to yourself for a period of time. I've experienced it. You lie to yourself. You lie to yourself. I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay. okay I'm not okay. God fix it, please. I can't do it. Who's been there? I've been there at least three times that I want to admit, right? But that's the place to get to is, to, is to come to God and say, my motives are wrong, God. Please, I, I want to honor you. Please help my motives be correct. And that comes from a place of devotion, knowing God, knowing his grace and his goodness is where we come from. That's where our worship, our activities come from. It's often disguised even from ourselves. but nothing, here's the point, nothing escapes the eyes of Jesus. He sees all. He sees it already. We, we can quit hiding it. Jesus sees it all. And that is good news. To some of us, you might, somebody in here might have been like, oof, Jesus does see all, doesn't he? I don't like that. It makes me uncomfortable. No, no, no. Switch that around. Praise God he can see it. Because you don't have to stay in your sin any longer. You don't have to stay in your lack of devotion any longer. You don't have to be so hyper-focused on doctrine that you forget to love people any longer. 
Because Jesus sees all and he wants to tell you about it. He wants to exhort you. He wants to correct you. So let's lay it bare. Let's make a commitment as we open up our word daily. I eat daily. Who in here eats every day? I eat every day. Who in here eats every day? Don't raise your hand. Don't, don't tell on yourself. It's okay. We should be eating every day, consuming his word. I lost my place here. Where are we at? <laughs> We need to be allowed to, to allow the word to change us. Verse three, here's, here's where I've been building this up to get to verse three, because remember, Jesus sees our motives and this is our next step. This is, this is meant to drive us to a place of devotion. In verse three, it says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. That name, I can, seriously, we could do a whole series of teaching on name theology. The, the, the idea that God places his name in us he placed his name in the angel of the Lord. What does it mean that, that the name of God, the character of God? That, that, that's a whole teaching. But the point is, is they, they started from a place of right doctrine, coming from a place of devotion. They, they started out right. But somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way, they got so busy making sure the doctrine is right, making sure they're taking care of people, doing the king's business, that they neglected the king himself. And then we lose. If we don't reconnect with Jesus, if we don't stay connected with Jesus, then we're not going to have a sincere love coming from us. And we're going to look like sterile Christians that just, they have no compassion, no love for others. And that's not the image. That's not the name we want to bear for others in the world. We want to bear a true image of Jesus. To bear that name, we have to know him. And you have to know him daily. My, a good friend of mine says, he says it this way. He says, without the root, you got no fruit. And you know who that is. So this is good news. This is good news. Because Jesus sees our motivation. He says it's for my name's sake. It started that way. But the, the good news is, is that he doesn't stop with just walking around and observing. Right? He looks into your hearts, those conducting his work. And only God can do that. Be encouraged. I don't believe demons can, can read minds. I believe demons are, I, I know Demons are real. Experientially, I know demons are fact. Yeah. And they will attack the church. But they cannot read your mind. Only God can. In fact, it says that in 1 Samuel 16, 7, Proverbs 16, 2. And then let's turn to Jeremiah 17, verse 10. So you don't have two witnesses there. You have three. It says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. I give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. You see the tie in there? Only God does that. Yep. Only God does that. So John is writing that their motivations for their good works was pure. It started from a good place. But they got unbalanced. They put more importance on the doctrine. Now, I, I need to define that term, I think. Doctrine. What do we mean? What do you mean doctrine, Josh? What does that mean? Well, there's a doctrine of Christology. There's a doctrine of soteriology. That's the doctrine of salvation. Christ, Christology. I don't think I need to explain that one, do I? Okay, uh, eschatology, there's all these, these different big words. Eschatology means end times. These are all doctrines, right? And so those doctrines must be correct. We need to have correct doctrines about how God wants us to live and who God is and what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. We need to understand that. But what we can do is, is we tend to, when we lose devotion, the doctrine tends to take over as the prominent one. And then it becomes so prominent and we're so busy doing all these things and we forget that we we're supposed to go back and talk to Jesus and reconnect with him because I have no love within myself. I have no good within myself. Only Jesus, only as I allow Jesus to live through me, am I good. But there's, there's also another implied truth here. That implied truth is, is that we can do some great works, but for the wrong reasons, for the wrong motives. And that's how burnout occurs. And I was really preaching to myself this week. Many of you know me. I, I do a few things. And, and I have to be real careful that I'm not just doing things, not finding that time for devotion, sitting down with the Lord, Bible in hand, pen and paper, even if it's just sitting on my front porch and just saying, God, I just want to hear your voice right now. Yeah. Yeah. We need that devotion. But too often I get so busy that I forget and I neglect those times. I'm just confessing to you and I repent. So let's do better as a church. Let's, let's make it important. 
of, of utmost importance that we're going to devote ourselves, devote time for, to the Lord. Devote that first and that, that, that greatest, right? That not, not the last of the day where you're all tired. You're like, okay, God, here I am. I said I'd give you 15 minutes. I'm so tired. I just want to go to bed. No, he wants that first, the, the, the most prized, the, the first 30 minutes in the morning. That's what the Lord wants. But, and here's another thing. We can strive to do lots of ministry. We can do a lot of things for the Lord in the Lord's name. But we must, we must start from a place of doing all things, if not just for people, not for myself, definitely, but doing them as if I'm doing them for the Lord. I'm doing this, I'm scrubbing this dish for Jesus. I am folding these clothes. For, who else hates folding, folding clothes? I hate folding clothes. I'm folding these clothes for Jesus, right? I'm serving my wife, yep. right? I can't do it for her because she might forget to tell me thank you, and that's okay. But Jesus sees my heart. He, that's the important. That's important. I know that's silly, right? Folding clothes. Why even bring that up? Because I'm doing an act of service, and I'm doing it for Jesus, and that's my point. And that's found in Colossians 3.23. So John was writing that their motivations were pure, right? But he, here's the thing is, is Jesus, and I've said it over and over again throughout, I kind of give you the, the third point at the, at the beginning was that Jesus desires devotion. So devotion. So Jesus is present in his church. Jesus sees our motivations and Jesus desires devotion. I'm getting tongue tied up here. Point is, is if you want to love like Jesus, you must be devoted to Jesus. That's it. You have to know him to act like him. In fact, you have to know him to allow him to live through you. That's the goal, right? To be spirit-led Christians. Look at verse four. Here comes the bad news. But this, but I had this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Now, this, this word abandon, this is a, this has some bad news, right? Um, that word abandon is ephemi. And I probably butchered that. That's okay. My Greek is horrible. But it means to let go. This is, not a, uh, this is not a forgot. Oh, I just forgot. No, this is a knowingly neglecting. In fact, this word is used for a man to divorce his wife. And so you knowingly, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm just too busy, God. I don't have time for you to pray right now. Okay, I'm, I'm doing your work, though. Doesn't that count? Here's me. I'm going to confess to you. God, I'm, I'm putting a message together for your church. Doesn't that count as my devotion time? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. I, I should sit down daily, open Bible, and my, my sole purpose is to get to know Jesus, to devote myself to him and allow him to speak to me, no matter how long it takes. You know, that love, it, this speaks of it, that love you had at the first, the love you had at first. And I'm reminded of, of my wife. I, I met my wife at a, a 7-Eleven parking lot. <laughs> True story. I looked over, and I'm not even kidding, I saw the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. And from that day forward, she actually gave me her number, and we exchanged names, and it was good. I did really good. I never thought I could, I married up. I never thought I could get a, a woman so pretty. But from that day forward until the day I left for the Army, we didn't spend, spend a single day apart. We saw each other at least 30 minutes every day. That's devotion. I could not stand to not be around her. As tired as I was from work, I used to roof houses in Florida, Anybody ever roofed a house? Man, it's hard work. I was tired. I was tired. But I would not go home until I stopped by to see her first. I was devoted to her. That's what John is saying here. That love that you had at the first, that early love, you've lost it. Not just lost it. Not, it slipped through your fingers because your, fi your hands are so full of all the stuff you're doing for me. I'm telling you to put something down right now so you can get back to being devoted to me. That way you can go do some things for me, but do them in the right spirit. Yeah. Am I hitting home with anybody? Yeah. It hit home with me. What tends to happen when our devotion, it slips, what tends to happen is we replace it with doctrine. We know. Like I said, this is, this is a knowingly neglecting. We know that our, our devotion is slipping, and we, what we do is we do more studies. We watch some more sermons. Ah, oh, I just need to be more prepared. I just need an answer to that question. And we do all the studies and all the material, but we haven't devoted ourselves to the Lord. And then we become what's called as the family fruit inspector, because we know it all. The family fruit inspector. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, hmm. Technically, Melissa, in Leviticus, it says, you know, 
You guys got me? But there's no love there, right? There's no love there. My, my motivation for correcting someone is to be the one that's right. Because I've done all my time devoting to doctrine instead of devoting to the one who is the doctrine. Anyway. So my question is, are you concerned with doctrine, so concerned with doctrine that you've forgotten, you've forgotten your devotion to Christ? And my answer was this, this week, it was yes. I, I, I repent. Lord, I, I, I see where I'm lacking there. I'm, I'm letting that slip through my fingers. I want to go back to you, Lord. But the, here's the, that was the bad news. Here's the good news. It's right here in the next verse. Look at verse 5. It says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. And do the works you did at first. See, this is where I believe in the inherency of God's word. See, John knew that pastors love alliterations, right? So here's your application alliteration. Remember, repent, and return. Remember, repent, and return. That was supposed to be a joke, but it wasn't funny. Got it. But there's our application for today is we're supposed to remember what we were doing before. Remember your first love. When you first came to Jesus, how you were devoted to him, how you couldn't miss a single church service because you wanted to know God and you wanted to know his people. Remember that passion you had at the beginning before you started doing all these things for me. Now, you remember that. That's where your goal to get back to is repent from not doing it from this period, right? Repent and then return to that place where you were completely devoted to me. Yep. Remember, repent, and return. Remember, I want to share this verse with you. Sorry. I want to share this verse with you in, in Psalms 103 because that's, I think we need a, a touch point for a remember. Let's remember what God has done for us. And what, In Psalms 103, and you want to know God's heart, you want something, you're like, Josh, where do I start with this devotion thing? Psalms, book of Psalms, open it up. Tomorrow, read, read the first five chapters. No, start with one chapter. Read that chapter. Read a, a chapter of Psalms every day. As you get more and more of that, drink five a day. You can, get, you can get through the whole book of Psalms in 30 days. But in Psalms 103, verse 2, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives, this is what our God has done, all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems the life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Now, that's, that's a promise of things that he has already done, but it's also a promise of things to come because there are still some of us walking around with sickness today, yes? And we pray for healing. God will heal right now. But sometimes we're meant to suffer, just like the church of Ephesus went through suffering. Sometimes that's, that's not the way God sees it right now. And I don't, I don't understand that always, and, it, and I have hard conversations with the Lord, especially when it's a dear friend going through something like cancer. Something to that effect. That's hard. But the truth is, is, is that we have those things. That's the God we can hold on to because we know when Jesus comes back and we're glorified like he is, all those things go away. There's no more tears. There's no more suffering for us. And we rule and reign with him for a thousand years and then on into the next aeon. So remember, repent. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that he is faithful and just to, to forgive us. And then return. And I was reminded of the story of Peter, Right? Everybody knows the story. He, Peter said, when Jesus was crucified, Peter said, I'm going fishing. He, he was returning what he did before Jesus. And Jesus met him on the shore right there. And he says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Different words for love. But the point is, is that Jesus restored Peter. It was so sweet. Jesus wants to restore you today to that place where you first were, when you were first passionate, zealous for God. You were going to change Clarksville. And I'm in a church of people that are zealous too. We could do this. But we've gotten so busy with all the stuff that we're doing, we've forgotten that it's important for each one of us to be devoted to the living God. Amen. So I love this about our God. He makes it easy for us to come back. We don't have to go through a 12-step process. It's simply just coming to him. <laughs> yeah, you guys are funny. We just come to him and we say, God, I've been messing up. I've been putting, I've been putting the emphasis on my doctrine and I know you want devotion from me. So God, will you help me? It's that easy. You can never be too far gone, far gone. There is no situation hopeless. There is no situation bigger than our God. None. Maybe you don't have a doctor problem. Maybe, maybe you're up here, when I'm up here, you're like, Josh, I don't know what pneumatology is, much less doctrine. 
I don't have a doctrine problem, but I hear you. I have a devotion problem, and I want to fix that. I'm speaking to you too. It's easy. Jesus gives us a way. But if you don't allow God to fix the wrong direction, you've been given a warning. Look at verse 7. I'm sorry, the finish up verse 5. It says, If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, this is really scary to me. Yeah. But what do you do with a lamp that doesn't, doesn't work? I have a lamp on my nightstand. It's one of those touch ones. You just touch it and it goes on and off, right? That's kind of cool. Um, but if that lamp fails to work, I'm not going to keep that lamp there. I'm going to throw it out and get a new lamp. That should speak to our hearts right now. I'm not motivated by fear. I'm motivated by fear of the living God, and I want to be close to him because he loves me and he has goodness for me. Verse 6, it says, Yet you ha this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, there's a few things about the Nicolaitans we could talk about here, but I, wanna, I want you guys to tune into the podcast. So we'll talk about that in the podcast, but I will say this. The word used for hatred here is an intense hatred. It's that intense hatred that the opposite, the opposite of what we should feel for people. Because look, what does it say? Yet you, this you have, you hate what? The works? The works. You don't hate the Nicolaitans. They're people. They're created by God. They're redeemable. I was, in my mind, I was unredeemable, but God did it. Nobody is unredeemable. No problem is too big. And so you don't hate the Nicolaitans. You hate their works. And I just want to say that today. And then verse 7 says, He who has an ear, let him hear. Yep. Check. What the Spirit says to the churches. Who's speaking here? Is it Jesus? I thought this was the revelation of Jesus Christ. Or is it the Holy Spirit? Yes. Yes, both. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And this seems like it's postscript to me, right? It seems like he, Paul, uh, John almost finished the letter and then added in this sentence. And that's important. I just want to point that out as we go through the book of Revelation. If those things stand out to you, ask yourself why. In your devotion time, ask the Lord, why is this important? And then compare and contrast with the other churches. I want to encourage you to do that. Anything I've said here today, check it. Go to the Word of God. Be Bereans. Let's, let's read our Bibles together. And I encourage you to, to send your uh, recommendations or your, your uh, suggestions to the, uh, the number we have provided for the podcast. And, and we will work through this together. That's the whole point of that is to encourage us to do Bible study together. And then it says, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat the tree of life. That, that word conquer there. Um, other places it's called overcomers. It's Nikeo. Um, it, it means hold fast to the faith, even unto death. It means don't forget the devotion to the way of Jesus. Devotion is the way to Jesus. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, we actually have the definition of what an overcomer is. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. It says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So our faith should be a faith that drives us to devotion. Our faith should be one that puts Jesus foremost in our lives and our devotion to him. Jesus is present right now in his churches. Amen. Yep. He sees our motives. He sees why you're doing the activities you do. Amen. Correct doctrine is very important to God. It's not cheap grace. He's a holy God. Let's not forget that. We're not going to cheapen grace here. But it must come from a place rooted in devotion to the living God. So if we want to love like Jesus, we must devote ourselves to him first. See, Joshua knew the importance of devotion. I opened this, this, this talk today about Joshua. He knew that if he wanted to be the man that God had called him to be, to be the man that led the people of Israel into Israel, um, he would first start in that tent of meeting. So I want to encourage you all today, go to your tents, go to your tent of meeting, whether it be your prayer closet, your car, your park, whatever it is, and devote yourself to God daily. God is calling us, doctrine's important, but God is calling us to devotion. For such a time as this, 
He's calling us to devotion.